Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Best Practices for Creating a Stunning Poster. Uh, my name is Christopher Stave, and I coordinate the Lane Medical Library's instructional program. And this is going to be the first of a series of talks that are going to be given on creating posters, giving better presentations, and developing uh, graphics. Uh, next week, I just wanted to point this out, February 24th, we're going to be giving a talk called The Very Best Practices for Presenters. March 30th is going to be a talk called 30 Minutes on How to Give a Great 10-Minute Conference Talk. Uh, March 8th is Optimizing Your PowerPoint and Keynote Presentation Graphics. And then on March 24th and 29th, we're going to be giving a two-part talk on how to create scientific figures using uh, Adobe Illustrator. So you can find out about these classes and more at Lane Medical Library's uh, website, which is lane.stanford.edu. These are all free and seats are still available, so please feel free to sign up. Uh, I'm going to be passing around a registration list. I'm going to start it up in the back, so if people could just check that off, check off their names, and if your name isn't on the list, just go ahead and add it. And there are also some evaluation forms in the foyer there. If you don't have one, please grab one on your way out. So with that, it is my uh, very great pleasure to introduce Sam Hertig, who's a uh, former Stanford postdoc in computational biology. Uh, Sam, it's all yours. Everyone hear me okay? Great. I'm just going to attach this somewhere here. Okay. Um, good morning and welcome everyone. Thanks a lot for coming by. Um, thanks a lot, Chris, for the quick intro. Um, I'm going to be talking about posters today, um, obviously. And um, maybe just a little bit more about me, what I've what I've done so far, and and where I'm where I'm heading to. Um, so I did a, I did a postdoc in Ron Drawer's lab here at Stanford in computational biology, but I've always had a passion for like data visualization, for scientific illustration, and these kind of things. So I just recently started my own little um, business, working as a freelancer. Um, currently working working for my first big contract, which is more um, it's more about like. Um, software development, but also um, 3D visualization in a web browser, so a lot of JavaScript, a lot of programming. But um, I also just enjoy like scientific illustration. Um, so let's see, what, I'm, what am I gonna talk about today? So um, I kind of have like these six little areas that I would like to touch on today. Um, first thing is, how are posters different from publications or for, from other like, you know, scientific communication channels? And then, is there something like search engine optimization for posters? Um, then, like I guess, like a big main chunk of today's talk will be graphic design for scientific posters. And then I quickly want to talk about um, the available toolbox that we can use to create posters. And then um, point number five is the actual poster presentation. Um, this is not going to be the main focus of the talk, obviously, but I do think that some elements there tie into actually the whole like layout of the poster. And then I want to point you to some further resources where you can you know, get more information, get more in-depth detail, not just on creating posters, but I guess like um, visualization in general, graphics design. And, and these things. Please interrupt me at, at any time and let me know if you know the audio doesn't work or, or whatever. Okay, maybe three more things, <laughs> what it's not about. So I'm not going to be diving into details of how to create a scientific figure. Um, as Chris just mentioned, there will be other classes that go into more detail there. I will touch on like a few basic like graphic design principles which are helpful for that topic as well. Um, I'm also not going to do a lot of like software specifics. Um, again, there will be an illustrator class later this term that you can attend. And then I'm also not really going to be talking how to write and how to present. So what makes posters unique? So actually, I first want to start with something that um, posters should share with a scientific pu publication. I think the overall flow of a poster can be very similar. This is also, oh, maybe one more general thing that I want to mention is everything I say today is not rules. I think it's more, think of it more as recommendations. 
So um, I think you could, you could consider the flow of a scientific poster similar to a scientific publication. So you can have like the same sections that you would have in, in a scientific publication, title, abstract, introduction, and you know, all the, the common things that, that I list here. So I guess from that point of view, we can say that's a similarity of posters and, and papers. But um, when we look at the purpose, um, we do see that posters can go beyond just that. So obviously for a scientific, for a scientific publication, um, we want to publish results, right? That's the main purpose, I would guess. That is pretty obvious. For a poster, um, there's more. So obviously you can present published results, right? To make them, you know, to spread the word. But you can also talk about or present unpublished results. Um, you may have the opportunity to also present more speculative results where you want more like audience feedback and present things that, you know, are maybe not that well established yet. Um, you might want to initiate new collaborations. You might be attending this conference. You know you're going to meet a lot of people, and it's a good opportunity for that, obviously. Um, you might be looking for funding or for renewal of funding, and you probably also want to network. You might even want to hunt for jobs. So these are all things that you know, might be expressed in, in, in your poster design. So another important point that I think is, is worth mentioning. It's not just about making the poster, it's also about you. So I think a poster presentation should take advantage of your physical presence. And it's important that you leave out actually details on the poster. Like, you know, keep it clear and simple and then you can deliver those details on demand. And I think that's, that's a very important um, thing to keep in mind because that helps keeping the poster lean and out get into more detail of that shortly. Um, and then obviously, as with all scientific communication, or I, I guess with communication in general, um, keep the audience in mind. Um, make sure you know who's going to be at the conference, who might the people be, who will be your visitors, your, your audience. And I think this is a central point. Um, and it's really important that you think about these things before you even start creating a because they might affect the layout, the design, and obviously the content of your poster. So um, another thing, title and abstract, when you submit that to a conference, it sometimes get registered. It can you know, be like saved in a database. So that can be considered published. So if you're talking about unpublished results, it might be good to, to um, keep that in. So SEO for posters, what do I mean by that? Um, SEO is the abbreviation for um, search engine optimization. So if you have a web page and you want to be found, you have to make sure that it lists, that it ranks highly on, on a Google search. And there's even something called academic SEO. And um, I listed a reference here where actually, you know, researchers are talking about that. How can you make sure that you get like higher rank there, but usually it's not something we have to worry about as scientists, right? If you write a paper um, with a proper abstract and title, you're probably gonna have all the keywords in there, and you know, if you do a good job in, in writing your paper, basically the journal is gonna take, take care of all the indexing and stuff. So it's not usually something you have to think about when you, when you um, publish a paper. And then there's, there's, you know, there's Google Scholar, there's PubMed, there's all these databases and, and archives where you can, where you can be found. But for posters, um, it's obviously completely different, right? So the question there is, how can I make sure if you're, you know, just picture the scenario of a conference with, I don't know, there could be hundreds or thousands of posters, right? So the question is a bit like, how will you be able to stand out? How will you get noticed? How will you be seen? So can we do an SEO for our poster? And obviously, there will be like title and abstract probably in a booklet that you know as a hand that you get as a handout from the conference organizers, but it still helps if we actually like visually will stand out, right? And um, for that, I think what we could do is we can borrow a slogan from marketing, and um, I think they call it attract and retain. That basically means you know you want to be. I mean, I put this little silly picture of a dragonfly and a flower. 
this basically means that you want to attract your audience, your visitors to your poster, but then you don't just want to like lose them when they're there, right? So you want to keep interest levels high. And um, the question is, how can we use like layout and design principles to, to optimize that? So um, importantly, this slogan doesn't imply that you know conference goers are just like bumblebees who would flock to the brightest and most glamorous flower in the room, and you know they would just be like mindless. Um, that's not what I mean. So um, we still have to like have sensible content and all these things. That's kind of obvious, right? So then, well, how can we how can we like attract? How can we stand out from the crowd without being too much. Um, for me, there are two main points um, with this whole attract business. Um, number one would be the title of your poster. Again, I think it's something pretty obvious, but it's, it's still good to, um, to keep that in mind. Um, have you know, a large title, have a legible title, have it like in a clear font. We'll talk about fonts later today. And um, make sure it's informative. So I think it could help, you know, instead of saying um, results on blah, 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 it's better to actually already have like maybe a conclusion in the title or like increase of, you know, 5% with this and this or something like that. So I think that that can definitely help. Um, and then number two, which might be even more important, is have a striking image as an eye catch. So it would have to be, it could either be one of the figures that you, would, you were going to put in the poster anyway, or it could be something, if those are not appropriate, if you think they're just plots and they might be a bit boring, like be daring, like think of something that could really like attract your audience, but still obviously have a connection with the work you do. And um, make sure it's large. And I will talk, I will introduce the concept of salience a little bit later. And make sure it's salient so that you can see it from far away. And um, a word of caution here is many, many of the templates that you will find, find, whatever format they are, like PowerPoint or Keynote or Illustrator, they might not encourage that. So they, may, they will already have like their column layout and you know, it might be hard to fit that in. So you might have to get a little bit more creative there and maybe even try making a poster without a template. So, so more, more on this salient principle <coughs> later. So this is, a, this is just an example poster that I want to show you here that I presented um, at the VISB conference um, last year. And um, I was a, or I have, I'm trained as a structural biologist, right? So there it's, you always have like good opportunities to show some structural data, some molecules, and um, you also have the possibility to render those in high resolution. So from that point of view, I was kind of advantaged but um, still you can see here that I, I chose this um, GAC pole molecule, which is an important part of the uh, HIV structure, as sort of my eye catcher, right? And I just blew it up to like a gi gigantic size that covers the whole poster. And um, you can see that even if the poster is pretty small and obviously you can't read the text, you might be able to read the, the title, you can still see that thing standing out here. And you know, that, I'm pretty sure that subconsciously a lot of um, conference goers are like, oh, what is that? I want to, I want to, you know, I want to go there and, and have a look at that. And this is, I guess, a, a good way to get your poster seen. Also notice that I tried to make the title stand out by, you know, having some white space here. I will go into more detail. White space or, or negative space, how it is sometimes called. And um, I made sure that you know the font is obviously pretty large. Okay, and then for the second part of this attract and retain, um, obviously the retain is as important as the attract. And I think it it, it helps to um, imagine that what you want to do is to bridge a br to build a bridge with no toll, basically from your brain to the audience brain, right? You have all this research, you have all this data, and you need to somehow get it over. You, you have to convey the message. And the easier it gets for the audience to do that, 
the better, obviously. Right? So this is obviously not just true for posters. That's, I guess, a general principle in, in science communication. And obviously, this is going to be tied to your content, um, but it's also tied to your layout. So let's talk a little bit about um, graphics design. Um, I will be pointing out some resources at the end of this talk, but I also quickly want to mention that up front, um, there's an excellent article series in, in Nature Methods by, by Bang Wong and uh, Martin Krzywinski and, and others about, um, it's called Points of View, and it, it's all about visualization and, and graphics and layout. and. Uh, a lot of the principle that you know the principles that I'm mentioning today are explained there in more detail. Um, I will sometimes have a reference when I cite when I show one of their graphics, but um, I think that's really worth to check out. It's not just for posters, obviously, it's for for anything visually. I think you can even download the whole. It's it spans like about three years, and you can even download the whole package. Um, as a feature thing on, on, on nature. Again, those I consider those recommendations and not rules. Um, so what is this salience thing? So I think of it as either like an, a visual like volume level or like a visual weight, right? And um, there's many different ways of how we can how we can convey salience. And um, I kind of just, you know, copied this from this one of these points of view articles. And here you kind of see all the different, the different um, methods of, of creating salience, right? So if you have a couple of elements or items or, or whatever they are, you can obviously use color to have something stand out. You can have size, orientation, shape. You can have added marks, which I guess is also a different kind of shape. You can have motion. So motion is usually like a very strong, um, it can convey like really strong salience. Um, for posters, I guess it's not going to be very important because we have a printed thing, right? There's, we can't have like a video on a poster. I'll talk a little bit about that too, but um, yeah. And then the last item here is um, obviously grouping, right? And basically what you want to try to do with a poster is to establish a salience hierarchy. So a salience hierarchy is basically like, where will your visitor's eye land first? Right? Obviously, that's why we put the title in, in like big font, right? So that means our eyes will first go to the title, but then you kind of want to direct the, the viewer's eye. You kind of want them to make like a, a predefined journey of the eye, and you can use salience to do that. I will again just illustrate that a little bit with the example poster that I just showed you before. And um, I have a different example right here. This is a small um, plot thing that I, I actually did this for my dad, who's, who's writing a book about universities and university rankings. It doesn't really matter what it shows. It's basically just a bar plot. I think it's about publications in, in different science areas of all these different universities. And um, it's pretty simple. We have those you know, five categories and, and 10 different universities. But notice that I didn't choose the brightest colors. Um, I sort of used a little bit desaturated colors. They're you know, a little bit soft. And if I do that, I still have the option to make stuff stand out, right? Here, I might want to put the emphasis on Hong Kong, right? So here I put more saturation. I put a little bit more of, of blackness into the color so it stands out. On the other hand, I could have started like this, right? And if I start like this, then I don't have room for any, like, I can't really create more, I mean, I probably could, and then it would look really messed up, but I don't really have room for like more salience. I can't really point things out anymore because basically this already is like screaming at you. So you want to try to avoid that. Um, another thing, or one of the main things that can create salience is color. Um, it's always good, and many of you already know that like intuitively, you can use color to group categorical data. So let's say you're presenting results from you know, five different experiments. They all gave slightly different results, but you still have an overall trend, right? You could, you could color those five curves like in, in, in one plot as, as the, in different colors. That's pretty obvious. Um, 
you have to be aware that color can also bias the audience. So if you use color for like quantitative representations like in a heat map, you have to be very careful. Like you don't want suddenly like middle values to stand out because they're brighter and stuff like that. So um, maybe like experiment a little bit whether you can have basic diagrammatic marks that stand out more instead of color. Um, Um, there's a little bit more detail here. So how can you choose like a proper color-like color palette for your poster? Um, first of all, in, in whatever software you're using, um, there's usually different ways how you can represent color. And for humans, it's usually best to pick this HSP, which stands for hue, saturation, and blackness, or, or lightness, basically. So th with these three values, you can basically um, produce all the colors that you, you can see on, on a computer monitor. And in many kinds of software, I think this is just a screenshot from um, Illustrator, you have this color wheel, right, with where you can basically, you can, either just, you, you can just use the mouse to like pick a color. And obviously the hue, which is like, you know, the actual color, you vary that by, by, by going around, like varying sort of this coordinate. And then the saturation, is least in the middle, where we just basically have a, a white, and the color gets more saturated towards the outside, right? And then the lightness, which is, or, or blackness, or whatever you want to call it, is basically an extra bar that you will have to, like, use over here. So even though we might be able to distinguish a couple of colors, maybe up to eight different colors in, you know, in, in our figure or poster, it's usually a good idea to kind of vary the lightness as well. So, and obviously the hue and the saturation, so you'll get the best distinction if you kind of spiral, spiral outwards in the color wheel to make different colors. So if you do that, you vary the hue, you vary the saturation kind of automatically, right? And then if you also choose different lightness, you'll get like a color pattern like this. So even if someone, I mean, it's, since you, you will be the person who is printing the poster and hopefully it will that in color, right? But even like if somebody has, whatever, like a color blindness or something, there's still a high chance that you'll be able to distinguish the different, the different colors. So um, that, that, that has helped me a lot to like pick my color scheme. Um, so let's talk a little bit about layout. Um, yes, so there are these principles of visual proximity and grouping, and I feel like it's something we're, we kind of have like an intuition about, like automatically, but still it usually helps me to think like, how can I, how can I show whether something belongs together? And um, there's different, there's different aspects here. So in this little first, this first little schematic over here, um, you see that the spacing between all the objects is the same. And we still kind of automatically do like a categorization because we have two stars and two circles, right? So here, just because like we, you know, we kind of associate similar elements with each other, I can kind of talk about a grouping that, you know, those two belong together and those two belong together, right? And then over here, I actually, I'm in a bad angle that it's really visible, yeah. <laughs> so over here, I, um, I increase the distance between, you know, those two columns, and automatically we start seeing columns, right? And then same thing over there, I just, you know, group them in a different way, and now we kind of associate those two elements and those two elements. But then I can also connect elements with like a bounding box, or I could have also just drawn a line here that connects them, and then we again have like a, a different association with that. And these things are going to be important for our poster, again, to like establish like the journey of the eye that we want the visitor to take. Because in a poster, essentially like the last step of the layout, what you're going to do is you have your graphics and you have your text boxes and you're going to all like compose them together to the poster, right? So it's, it's very good to like imagine that all these elements of your poster are like shapes Right, so if you have a text block, just consider that like as a square shape, obviously. 
and if you have like an eye catcher in the middle, it might have like some random shape. But you still, it's almost like a puzzle <laughs> in a way. You still want to like compile those like in, in, in the best way possible. And there's a, a very like proven system to do that in, I guess, in, in, in base out, basic like layout design. And it's called the grid system. And I really think you need a grid system for a poster. And I do think most templates that you would use already have that. Um, but I think if you're really clear with the grid, you it actually gives you more freedom and flexibility at the end. So um, if you really follow a, like a, a rigid grid, you can actually, like most templates that I see, they always have like, everything is like in these boxes. And it, I guess it's also a matter of personal taste, but you will, you will often see that when you follow a grid, you don't even need like the actual edges of the boxes anymore. And I do think it can, it can like provide for a more uncluttered look that is often, often advantages. So, um, there's always the question like how many columns you want to have, which is of course like tightly tied to your grid, right? And um, I'm just giving you a little bit of theory first and we'll show you like the details later in, in the example in my case. Um, so the width of text box should be chosen such that the length of your lines falls between 60 to 100 characters. That's just a rule of thumb. Um, it's, I think it's again a good recommendation to follow. It will make it easiest for your readers or for your visitors. Um, if you follow that, this will usually result in like two to four columns for a poster. Because again, you don't want to have the text too small. Um, you usually have either like a portrait or a landscape shape for your poster and that's what you will end up. So um, there might be exceptions, but I think that's a good rule of thumb. And then Again, like once you actually follow these rules, you may break them. And this is again something that's probably going to be a matter of, of personal taste. But so you the grid in, in, in my case. So I would actually recommend when you when you when you lay out your poster in, in whatever software you'll be using, it's good to actually display the grid lines. And ultimately, of course, you're not going to print them, but it, it's great to have them. And um, in my case, I'm just, in this case, I just have like a, a very simple like two column grid. Um, I chose a portrait orientation of my poster just because I wanted to max out the space that the conference would give me for the poster board. Um, usually I would actually recommend landscape, but that later as well. And um, you see that basically all of the, the text, I still call them text boxes, even though you don't see like the edge around it. All of the text boxes are basically within the grid. Um, I have like one little figure here, which I also adjusted in a way such that it would actually ma like max out the width of, the, of that column. And then um, my um, molecule here in the middle sort of violates a lot of that, right? I mean, it's, it's too wide here, it, it goes, outside the grid lines over here and it also fills the middle. But I do think because the rest is so clearly like within the rules that that doesn't matter. So I think the eye still has enough like anchor points to see, oh yeah, there's this, this clear like um, two column grid layout. But I think before you start violating the rules, it's good to actually follow them and, and, and pay attention to that. That's sort of obvious, I guess. Okay, um, I sometimes like to compare, like, as you already know, the visual stuff with audio. Um, just before I was introducing salience and it's almost like a, a visual volume level. So there's obviously also silence, right? And that is your white space or your negative space. Um, yeah, I had to put this quote of thing. <laughs> um, here I just have like a little schematic of, of a poster, um, which, you know, might have some figures, might have some text boxes. 
And then the white space is obviously everything that is around it, right? And here I just inverted the picture. So here the black part is, is obviously the white space. Um, your goal is to unify the negative space. So it's basically this is just another way of looking at, you know, how are your elements laid out on a poster? Are they aligned? Are they not aligned? If, if everything is a little bit more chaotic, you will also see that in your negative space. So it will be discontinuous. It will be non-contiguous. Non and um, that's, that's not what you want. So the more contiguous the white space is, you know, the, it will just have like a, a stronger visual appeal. And it, it just sometimes helps me to actually look, look at my poster from this perspective and just check, do I have enough white space? Like we're always like, oh, can I cram this in? I also want to talk about this result because this was so amazing and it took me two years to do those experiments, but no. <laughs> Um, yes, actually, I think um, you can use negative space to control salience. So if you have enough white space around your poster, it might even help it stand out a little bit more. Again, imagine the scenario of the horror scenario of thousands of posters that are screaming at you. But if you know there's a little bit of tranquility around your poster, it, it might be good. Um, it might help it stand out more. Okay, so usually when you when you publish a paper, um, oh sorry, go ahead. You know, I don't think I can give you any numbers, but it's a very good question. Um, Oh, you mean you mean actually now the white space, like um, the vertical white space that will go between between two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think whether there's like a general answer to your question. Um, I actually think I will talk about that shortly, but it's probably not going to be like a like a a quantitative answer. Because I really kind of think it depends on your text, you know, whether you have bullets, whether you have text, and it's it, it's more important to like have a hierarchy there as well. But I, I'll, I'll talk about this shortly. Let me know if it's still if you still have questions after that. Thanks. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about typography. Um, usually, when you you know when you um, publish a paper, you obviously have to do the graphics, but then you don't really worry about your um, typeface because that's usually defined by the journal, right? So when you're creating your poster, it's going to be a lot of fun because you can choose your own typeface or your favorite typeface. Or maybe you shouldn't use your choose your favorite typeface. <laughs> so the question is, does it matter, right? And um, I actually just read about that when I, when I was pre uh, preparing this presentation like a few days ago. There is a study where I think it was a, a person working for the New York Times who did sort of a survey. I think he had like about 40,000 participants and they all had to read, I'm actually not sure, they had to read like a scientific text with a you know, new groundbreaking scientific result, which I think was true, that was not like made up or anything. And then they had to like assess like, is that true? Do you believe in these results? How credible is that? And the only, so there were several groups of like, you know, participants. And the only thing that varied between those groups is the actual typeface that this text was presented to them. And um, Comic Sans was one of them, and Baskerville was one of them, and I think there were a few others. I, I don't remember which ones that was right now. And it's actually, there is a difference that was statistically significant, which I think is amazing. It's just like, you know, low, lower, lower like, like single digit percent, like maybe one or two percent. But um, Comic Sans was like low, as you kind of, kind of expect. And um, Baskerville won. So if you want to be really, really, really credible, choose Baskerville. I don't know. <laughs> um, I just thought that that's very fascinating. Um, I think like the actual typeface is not super important. There is an important distinguish or sort of like two categories of typefaces which um, 
Maybe some of you are already aware of that, or it's kind of obvious there is serif typefaces and sans serif. So the serifs are these little things here that you see. And the usual recommendation is that if you have like larger blocks of text, you should use serif fonts because they're easier to read, like, you know, if you have like long lines and stuff. And sans serif, you know, look a little bit less cluttered, they're a little bit more simple. And um, so you can use this, these for shorter text. Now, I usually try to keep my text very minimal on posters, and I personally like sans serif, so I usually use that, but you know, if you absolutely must have like text, like as in like a paragraph, you know, with a few connected sentences, then you might as well use uh, serif fonts. And you can even try to stick to sans serif for your title. I think the most important takeaway here is um, pick one and dump the rest. Maybe two, but not more than that. And this is sometimes not so easy because you might be tempted to have, oh, I already have this figure that I made for my um, publication. I can just recycle that. I'm usually like picky enough to go there and actually like, you know, replace these fonts and make sure everything is complete. I think um, your audience will appreciate. Um, oh yeah, these are just kind of my, my, my personal recommendations. Um, again, it's, or not again, but it's sometimes, yeah, don't use the default. A little bit, we'll get to that later. Um, Helvetica is sort of like a standard font. It's maybe a little bit overused these days, but it's still one of the most clear, and I think it looks pretty nice. Um, I like Avenir, this, this presentation. Um, Hypatia is a little bit more edgy, maybe, but it's still a sans typeface that I like. And um, for fonts with serifs, those last two ones, you can always use Times New Roman. I think it's not so bad. Again, this is kind of a matter of personal taste. I like Garamond as well. And um, to kind of answer your question about, you know, how much white space do you need, um, I think the most important thing if you have, like, you know, text and bullet points and stuff is you want to show the hierarchy of your text. So if you look at this slide, I, what I could have done is I could just have pressed return after like every line, right? But I didn't. You see like this white space is a little bit bigger than those. So you immediately see like, oh yeah, these kind of five guys here, they belong together, like they're, they're one group, right? But this here is, is really like a new, a new bullet, like a new paragraph. So I think as long as you pay attention to this hierarchy of bullets or, 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 or paragraphs or whatever you'll have, um, I still recommend bullet points and not text for posters. Um, make sure that you actually play with your text editor or, or, or with the, you know, the vector graphics software that you will be using and make sure to um, establish that hierarchy. So it's again the same pr principles that I just um, introduced earlier about grouping, right? So here we would just write it. Does that kind of answer the question or, yeah. So I really think like, you know, try and see, like try different things. You'll, I think usually people can tell, but it's important to experiment. And I find it's the same actually when I'm like, you know, moving into a new room and I don't know where which furniture should go. I have to place it there and see how it looks. Like I can't really imagine how it will be. So it's really kind of like at this layouting stage, it's, I think there's no way around trial and error. As scientists, we always think, oh, trial and error is bad. I want to program everything. I want to have it deterministic. But I think for, for layout, it's, it's part of the process. So don't be shy and just you know, try out stuff. Okay, so last slide on typography. Um, again, you can have salience in typography, right? And traditionally, we can underline stuff. Um, underlining is a little bit frowned upon by like design professionals. And to be honest with you, I can't really like give you like a scientific explanation for that. I think it's just because it, you know, introduces like additional clutter to your text and stuff. So I usually try to avoid it and I'm usually happier with the results when I do. Um, you can, you still have like a multitude of options to create salience, like a salience hierarchy in your text, right? We obviously put the title in like large, large font because we want it to stand out, right? 
So you can use different font sizes, or you can make text bold, you can have italics, or you can even vary the text color a little bit, but there, again, you have to be very careful. Like, I sometimes use, instead of black, I sometimes use an 80% gray. Um, actually, I think on this presentation, I think my titles are usually in black, and my main text is in like 80 or 90% gray. But try not to go below 90, uh, yeah, try not to go below 80, because otherwise, you're sacrificing too much text. Um, same goes if you have a, you can also have a poster with a black background, obviously, and then have white text. Um, then you can have like a light gray instead of a dark gray. So this is an additional means of how you can vary that. Um, minimum font size for posters, it's always an issue. 24 points is, is what I've been reading most places. I, Usually just make sure that it's as big as possible, that kind of sounds good, but that's what I end up doing because the risk is always high to have too much text, right? So get rid of some text and make sure it's, it's legible. Um, another good thing that I like to do is, I'll be touching upon that also a bit later. Um, I usually, before I print the poster, I do a little test print, like in standard size or like letter size, and then, um, I can kind of see the thing right before I would before I would waste like a whole poster size paper, and ideally you want to be able to read everything on there still. And if you have problems there, if you start squinting, I think then your text might be a bit too big. That's sort of my rule of thumb. But um, 24 points is sort of the literature value for that. Um, so what I mean by follow the same rules as in publications is make sure that you know your species names are all that thing. I think all these rules that, you know, the good journals would do to, to their um, formatting apply for a poster as well. So if you're unsure, just, you know, go see how, the, how does nature work, how does science work, whatever, your favorite journal, and, and follow these rules. But you have to pay attention to that because usually if you just, if, you, if you're doing a publication, like the layout people from, from the journal will take care of that, right? As opposed to you have to do it yourself, so make sure you follow these common rules. Actually, I think for most manuscripts that you'll submit, you have to like already like follow those rules anyway. Okay, I've already kind of um, mentioned that a little bit. How much text? And I, I guess I'm a graphics person, so <laughs> I try to reduce it. I know it's overused, but a picture says more than a thousand words. Um, most posters I see or I come across have, in my opinion, way too much text. And again, try to like, you know, try to imagine the scenario with like hundreds of posters, they all have text, like, they all compete for the audience's audience. So I think if you can give them a break by, oh, this one looks pretty cool, it doesn't have too much text. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna, they're not gonna get like all the details. But this relates back to what I mentioned earlier. Um, make, like, take advantage of your physical presence, like details on demand. It's almost like, it's almost like the third level of information. So the first one will be your eye catcher, which kind of attracts the audience. Level two is sort of what they see when they're closed. And level three, if they have extra questions, you'll be there, right? Or your email address will be on the page. So, Um, yeah, then, um, yeah, this is a good point that actually H.A., who is sitting in the back of the room, like, brought to my attention. Like, there's always, like, this issue of, well, now you could argue, oh, is my poster still going to be self-explanatory, right? Um, at a large conference, your poster is going to be hanging there maybe for a few days, and there might be visitors um, who might just walk by when you're not there, right? So. I guess you'll just have to try to find a compromise of, you know, having the overall poster be comprehensible without you being there. But again, if they need detail, they can contact you. Yes. Um, I think you would have two options. You could either have it, I think it would either be like top, like just where the affiliations are, like in a publication. I usually put it at the bottom right. I sort of feel like that's the standard, and that's where, where people will look for. 
that's what I do. Yeah. Um, let's see. Follow this here. I'm really zoom in. Oh, okay. So what I have here, you probably can read it, but um, I have the acknowledgement and then I have just a sentence. I embedded it into the acknowledgement. I just say correspondence to and then my email address. Yes, Chris. Uh-huh. Um, Good question. I actually didn't get that many comments on the poster itself. I think the discussions rotated more about the work, which is sort of what you want ultimately, right? Um, yeah, so I think that's, that was the goal, which is good. So this was on an A0, roughly. So it, it was, yeah, it was pretty big. Oh, okay, so, um, okay, here I have, the authors would like to thank David Goodsell for helpful discussions, and this work was supported by all the funding agencies, period, and then I have my sentence, correspondence address to, address correspondence to, and then my email. Okay. Okay, yeah, something I already mentioned. Um, if you can, I strongly encourage bulleted lists instead of full text blocks. Um, again, it's also a matter of, of, of time, right? For, especially for larger conferences, your, your audience will, not, will just simply not have that much time to spend at each and every like, single poster. So you have to like, get your information across quick. Okay, then, um, oh yeah, these are some, some quotes. Um, there are some, there's a couple of good papers that will also like provide you some more information on, on this topic. Um, I'll also list them at the end of this presentation. One is 10 simple rules for better figures, um, and then also 10 simple rules for a good poster presentation. They're part of this 10 simple rules series of um, PLOS, computational biology. And, um, uh, the first one, the better figures one, mentions this first quote, remember in science, message and readability of the figures is the most important aspect, while beauty is only an option. Um, I really like that paper. I think it has great recommendations. I disagree with that. <laughs> so <clears throat> if you Google definition of beauty, um, <clears throat> sorry, one of the things that, that comes up is beauty is a combination of qualities such as shape, color, or form that pleases the aesthetic senses, especially the sight. I think that's exactly what you want for a scientific like visual communication. So I don't think it's just an option. I think it, it really helps like conveying the message. But then again, don't try to be too flashy and don't try to impress. Um, another quote that I just wanted to <coughs> reproduce one to one, excuse me. Use graphics for clear portrayal of complexity, not to impress and possibly be wilder viewers with complex artistry. Allow a figure to be viewed in both a superficial and a detailed way. So here, just you know, substitute figure with poster, and it's pretty much again the same concept. Um, lastly, the ABC of scientific visualization. Um, I kind of stole that from a scientific visualization company. Accuracy, beauty, and clarity. I think this is also can be like one of the guiding rules, not just for posters, but also for, for figures or whatever visual material you're preparing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about tools. Um, I think of making a poster as having like, almost like three layers of visualization. Maybe you, you would just consider the first layer as visualization and the other two are more like layout, but um, let me introduce you like the, the steps here. So the first step is visualizing the data, right? Um, that's something that you 
most likely would have already done before you start making a poster, right? That's probably something you already, you, if it's published, you might have, you will have done that for your paper already, or you will have done that for just like, you know, seeing the data for the first time for yourself. And um, here I'm just using this example of a bar plot, right? So this might be coming out of, I don't know, matplotlib or even Excel or whatever, right? And then, um, Step two would be to actually composite or like lay out a figure, right? Um, usually like one of the common things here would be add a label. This step, I'll talk a little bit later, uh, more about this step later. And then only in the third step, I would take my text and all the figures and lay them out to a poster, right? These are the sort of the three <coughs> categories that I would like to um, distinguish between here. So let's quickly talk about um, Category one, um, just sort of the tools here. Again, I think this will be something that um, Kat Ng will cover in more detail in, in later classes here at Lane. Um, I sort of think here, again, you have like several categories of tools. Um, one is for image manipulation, um, you know, that's like ImageJ and Photoshop and, and GIMP and these kind of tools. Another one is for plotting. Um, sometimes you could just use Excel. Um, I think for plotting, it's actually good to have um, something that's based in, in a programming environment because that gives you several advantages over like just having like an Excel file or something. Um, it's easier to have something, you know, reproducible. Um, you might have to like produce like, I don't know, literally like hundreds of plots. So then if you have code that you can reuse or just re-execute, then it will save you a lot of time. Um, so here, for this particular category, I think something like more programmatic is actually good. And then, obviously, like in whatever field you're working, you'll have your special software. Um, <clears throat> in my case so far, it was mostly like, you know, um, protein visualization software, but if you're more of like a networks person, you might use Cytoscape. There are like hundreds of tools out there, like depending on, on your scientific field. And then the fourth point here, um, you might have to draw a schematic of, I don't know, a protein or, you know, an organ or something. So um, you might also use um, some kind of vector graphics software here at this stage. That could be Illustrator, Inkscape, PowerPoint, Keynote, or, or even LaTeX for, for the LaTeX aficionados. Okay, so this is sort of like the first step. And then um, step number two is what I call to like compositing figures. And this step, I feel like some people are, it, it's often like there's a danger that you would skip this step. And um, I would like to argue why this step is important. So obviously if, if I produce a plot with like, let's say R or, or Python, maybe using matplotlib, you know, I can, I can already generate the labels and stuff, but I often find that it's kind of hard and that I might never get it like, exactly the way I want it and I have to try again and again and I just can't get that, you know, that legend to be one centimeter more on the left or whatever, right? So um, I often end up fixing text that I couldn't get right programmatically with like a, a in, um, with like a vector graphic software like Illustrator or, or um, Inkscape or one of those. Um, I, off, I almost always also use these kind of software tools to add captions and labels. Um, <clears throat> If you want to create a multi-panel figure that, you know, has elements from different softwares, you have to combine them somehow, right? And that's usually probably not something that you could do in, in like a plotting software. So again, here you have to use something that um, lets you lay out stuff. Um, I think this step, in contrast to step one, um, it's best if you can actually use a vector graphic software with a GUI, meaning with a graphical user interface. I want to be able to arrange my elements like with my mouse. I want to drag them around and see, oh, okay, now it looks good. And um, yeah, so I know like if you're crazy, you could do that in LaTeX, for example, but you have to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm pretty sure you could come up with awesome stuff, but for me, it's usually like more of a pain than of a gain at this stage. And um, so why do I keep mentioning like vector graphics software? I'm not sure whether everybody's aware of like pixel-based like graphics and vector-based graphics. Should I quickly explain that or should I? Okay, so um, 
in a vector-based graphics, I basically have like a mathematical representation of my object, right? So text is, is like usually vector-based. So if I enlarge this slide, um, I, I, can just, I can just change the font size to a thousand here, right? And I won't see any pixels at, if I'm looking at it from here because I basically have a mathematical representation of like this little P in graphics should look like, right? Um, it's the same if I use Illustrator and I will draw a box, right? I can, I can enlarge that box like a thousand fold and I still won't see any pixel because I have a mathematical, like behind the scenes I have a mathematical description. Oh, I have two vertices and they're connected by a line with this thickness, right? But that info is not like baked into any pixels yet. If I take a photo with a digital camera, um, I will have a pixel-based image, right? That could be a JPEG, that could be a bitmap or whatever. And there, when I enlarge it, um, I won't gain any new pixels, right? I just have what I have. So if I print that out, if let's say I take a, a picture with a, let's say, older digital camera and I print that out on an A0 format, like large poster, I will start seeing pixels, right? And um, now I'm kind of sliding into the topic of like resolution and print resolution. Um, so for a poster, what you want to usually have is I try to aim for at least 150 dots per inch. Now I'm, I'm doing a little detour, but I think it's, it's important that I can mention that right now. Um, so on your screen, you have 72 dots per inch. So that means if I have 72 pixels that make up the length of one inch, I'm good. I won't really see the pixels yet. If I have less, I start seeing the pixels, right? Now for print, like in a journal, like if, 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 if you guys have submitted articles to journals, they usually say we need at least 300 dots per inch, right? So if you just have like a schematic that you drew with a vector software, you're like, you're good, like because there's no limit to the resolution. If you have like pixel-based images, you have to make sure that you have the minimum resolution. So um, to give you an example of, of why this could be a problem, um, I used to use Chimera, which is um, a software for like visualizing proteins and, and DNA and just like 3D structures of organic macromolecules, and um, it has a function where you can actually put labels. You know, maybe you have a protein and you want to see, oh, the distance between this atom and this atom is, let's say, 20 angstroms. Um, the software actually allows you to put a label and then you can sort of like render that to an image, right? And you can use that in a publication. What if I want to use that for my poster, right? It's going to be much bigger. I have to enlarge the image. My text will start get pixelated, not just the text, the entire image, right? But my text is going to look especially ugly because I, I lost that mathematical description, right? I'm, I'm only like pixel based now. So if you use an extra software for doing the labels that like vector based, you will never have that problem. You might still have issues if you use bitmaps and, and JPEGs and like pixel based images, you know, there's not much you can do, but at least text wise you're good, right? So this kind of like lets you like recycle images for, for, for various purposes without actually losing resolution. So that's why you should use like, I would do, I would never do this in Photoshop. I would do this in Illustrator as an example or Inkscape or whatever. Um, yes, that's sort of what I wanted to say. Is this, does this make sense or do I, should I go in more detail? This is just like a small example. Um, <clears throat> so this actually comes from, from Chimera, like this rendering. This comes from a different molecular graphics package. Um, panel A here, that's a vector graphics thing that I just drew in Illustrator. And um, you know, I had to add like the, 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 the panel labels here. I wanted to add labels of the proteins and all these kind of things, right? I, I, I couldn't have done that just using one of the molecular graphics packages. So that, that would be like a composited figure, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so 
I feel like, okay, this is again like a personal recommendation. Um, I think there are two, two main choices that I would, or like a main choice I would do, I would either choose Illustrator or Inkscape. So I don't know much about Inkscape. It's the, basically the free version of Adobe Illustrator. I heard that it caught up a lot in recent years and it's become very powerful and it's free compared to Illustrator. Um, if you or your lab you know, can get Adobe Illustrator via Stanford or, or via one of those resources, then you might as well shoot for that. But I would, either, I would use either one of those two. Inkscape, yeah, it's totally free. You can just download it and um, I heard very good things about it. It's on my list to try out. I've just never used it so far because I'm, I have used Illustrator for the last 10 years and habit thing, I guess. But I would use one of those two. Okay. I'm not familiar with it, so oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm not. I would have to look it up. Okay. Yeah. I, I I've heard of it, but I honestly don't really know like what what the main uses are and. But I, I would guess if it makes, so it does actual plotting for you, right? Yeah. So then, okay, I would guess it, it's probably like something vector-based. So another important thing is, oh yes, AJ? Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? You can, okay, okay, yes. <clears throat> so I guess in this case, like, so in this, in this case it would be important that you actually, like when you import stuff into let's say Illustrator um, from a different software and that let's say it's a plot and not necessarily something that has to be pixel based, try exporting it with the first software in PDF or EPS format. Because if you do that, it's still like a vector based image. EPS is another like vector based format. Great, thanks for getting the discussion started. <laughs> um, so yeah, so okay, I was I was trying to like introduce these three levels. So this sort of like compositing a figure is kind of a level level two step. And then for our posters um, we have to sort of do the same thing again, but this time on the poster level, right? We might already have some figures, we wrote our text, and now we have to compile everything together to like make one, one poster. And um, basically here it's the exact same story that we've just touched on, which is um, use a vector-based graphic software with a GUI to like make a poster. And basically why I'm telling you all this, or like the main point here is, in all those three categories, or, or those three steps, I mean, the vector, the vector graphics software came up in every step, right? So learn one of those if you haven't already. Like I think that's really essential and that will help you in the future and it's really like a good investment. And um, as I said, you can sort of cheat your way around step two by doing everything maybe in, in your primary software that you know helps you plot the data, but I usually don't recommend it. And for a poster, you basically don't have a choice, right? You have to use PowerPoint or, or Illustrator or, or whatever. And um, yeah, as I already kind of like recommended is I would go for either Illustrator or Inkscape. Um, even though they're considered like kind of professional, but ultimately we all are professionals, right? We want our stuff to look good. We want to make sure like it gets the message across. So I think it, it's like definitely worth the investment. And one more thing that's maybe sort of like a software point 
the default settings can be dangerous. Um, again, here I just like to actually copy paste that from and simply use for better figures. Um, since default settings are to be used for virtually any type of plot, they are not fine-tuned for a specific type of plot. In other words, they're good enough for any plot, but they're not their best for none. I think that's very true. Uh, I, I um, <clears throat> got this from this blog that is kind of entertaining sometimes. I'm not sure whether these are default settings of any kind of software, but um, this is sort of the risk you run into when, when you're doing the defaults. I don't think I have to say anything about here. Um, this is also sort of a three, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be, it's two dimensional data obviously, right? But it has this additional like 3D thing going on that confuses you. Um, also note the X axis. <laughs> anyway. And I don't even remember where this is, like where this junk chart guy took it from, but um, I just had to show it. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so a little bit about the whole like poster presentation thing in general. That's not just, you know, layout. Um, some things I will have already mentioned. Um, inform yourself about the maximum allowed size. I think that's important because you always want to max out the size of your poster, right? Because we already know we, we want to make sure we have enough white space and all that stuff. Um, make sure you know that. Also, um, think about landscape or portrait. That's, of course, going to depend on, on the maximum size that they allow. I think landscape is a little bit better optimized for, for humans because our like natural field of view is more wide than it is high. So I think if you can, like, try to shoot for landscape, I think ultimately it might not matter. I think just maxing out the available space is, is the important message here. Um, it's become a little trendy to actually have like, you know, a tablet with you and some conferences actually encourage that. I think that's cool. Think about that before you start with your poster because that might sort of again like, you know, change your layout choices, change the choices that you make for the stuff that will actually be on your poster. So think about, oh, I have this video that I absolutely have to show. Then you can bring your laptop, have, have your laptop or your, your tablet with you. I think that's great. Some conferences even provide like screen uh, computer monitors that you can use. Um, then that changes the game, obviously. I think that's really cool, but I guess that's not really standard yet. And um, okay, before you print, um, that's something we already like talked about. Yeah, make sure like your contact details are there, your affiliation. I sometimes see that people don't like acknowledge, like have, they just omit the acknowledgement probably because they ran out of space. Um, I think that's a very bad thing to do, especially for a poster because you're going to be networking and everything. I'm going to make sure that's on there. Um, do a standard size test print. That's something that I already mentioned. Um, for one, several reasons for that actually. One is my kind of rule of thumb about the, the font size. Um, I also like to, I have this weird thing, maybe that's just me. I like to read something that's printed and check it like a last run for typos when it's printed. I seem to like always spot something that I didn't spot um, on the computer screen, but that's just me maybe. Um, another reason why a test print is good, um, there's this whole issue of color spaces. I didn't want to go into that in too much detail today. I guess since you know we have ample time, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, so there are basically two. Do you, do you guys want me to quickly touch on that, or should I continue? So there's RGB versus CMYK, right? So RGB is red, green, blue, and CMYK is cyan, magenta, yellow, and and K for for carbon, which is just black. Um, a computer monitor, like you know, creates the colors with those three, like elementary colors, red, green, and blue. Printers work differently, right? They have they have three different colors and they have an extra cartridge for black. So how are we going to handle this? So what I usually do is you you have basically have two options. You can you can do your poster like on the computer in RGB, right? And then in the end um, you can save it as a PDF maybe, and you can change it to CMYK, right? And you will often notice like a, a little shift in the blue tones. And sometimes, maybe in extreme cases, that can kind of mess up your colors. It's usually not that bad, but it can. So other people actually prefer to work in CMYK the whole time. So if you're using Illustrator, I'm pretty sure Inkscape would have something similar. 
By the way, I'm not affiliated with Adobe or anything. The thing I just usually use as an example, since it's my, the tool that I use. Um, you have like a, a mode, like your document has like this mode setting, so you can choose CMYK from the beginning and then just work in that. Um, but the main reason I'm mentioning it here is, I remember I once had a poster that had a black background, and then I you know, had other like figures or, or like text boxes on there that also had black backgrounds because I wanted you know, them to be like fit in the same scheme. When I printed it, I noticed, oh, some of these blacks are not the same, right? So that means when you, when you convert a black from RGB to CMYK, um, how is it gonna work? I mean, if we have 100% carbon, then it's gonna look like black on our screen, right? On our screen. But we can still add some C and some M and some Y to that, and it's still gonna be black. But it's gonna be, I think there's special terms for that. I'm not even aware of them. There's like a rich black and a deep black and all these terms. They basically mean you have 100% carbon and you have varying levels of CMYK. So I think if you have a black background or like a lot of you know, black stuff that blends into each other, I would actually, yeah, maybe switch to CMYK in the beginning and make sure you use the same black for all your elements on the page. Especially if stuff like blends into but this is something you will notice when you do this, your test print and you know, fix that. You wouldn't waste like a huge amount of paper in that way. Um, yeah, I also like to look at the print from, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Sounds like a word specific issue. Okay. But I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean Word might just have a so you imported a CMYK into Word. I don't think I've ever done that. It might just be something that Word doesn't like. I'm I'm not sure. I mean if you know it yeah, if you know it never goes to print, I think it's safe to stay in RGB. Um, so since you already have that test print, I also like to look at it from a distance and again see, you know, is my, is my like salient hierarchy like I want it to be and, and stuff like that. Do I have enough white space and, and all these kind of things. <clears throat> Lastly, there's the question of cloth versus paper. Um, I think the quality is, 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 is very good on both. I started liking option one here just because I always I always forget my poster cases when I travel because I'm forgetful. Um, you won't need this because with cloth you can just fold it and, and put it in your suitcase. That's the only difference here. Um, yeah, this is sort of has nothing really to do with the layout, but good things to know. Um, Again, think about, you know, your audience won't have much time at your poster. Have that elevator pitch ready, like sell your work in 10 seconds or whatever you want to call it. Um, something that I guess it's also kind of obvious, try using your poster as your like guiding through the thing. Don't, don't bring like flash carp. Um, it's good to bring other stuff, maybe even like standard size copies of your poster or some relevant papers. And since I'm paranoid, I always bring spare pins as well. Um, and then during the session, again, I kind of introduced this concept early. Um, take advantage of, of, of your presence, but you know, make sure you're engaging and, and do the eye contact stuff and all, all these kind of things. And then again, details on demand. Um, again, something that I just had to like take one, um, one to one from this paper here. Um, if the poster is well designed, it should be possible for the presenter to hit the high point and then wait to see if the audience has questions about any of the details without sacrificing either clarity or credibility. Just nicely summing it up. 
Okay, we are almost there. Um, just a, some more links for you guys. I've already mentioned quite a few of them. I'm not much of a blog reader, so let me know if you have some blogs. I like those two. Um, Better Posters is just, just a, I think he's also a scientist guy, which is like does critiques of posters and he does a really great job on that, I think. Um, that weird default setting plot that I showed you is from Chunk Charts. Um, it's also some kind of data visualization guru guy um, who, you know, analyzes like data visualizations and critiques them. Let me know if you have any others that I should be aware of. Um, talk about that more. Um, some books that could be interesting. Um, this is actually on on the very top of my reading list. I, I haven't read it. It's basically a, a style book for writing, but um, many of the concepts you can actually apply to visual stuff as well. So I think that could be an interesting read. Um, I'm not sure whether people know about this person, but Edward Tufte is very famous for like all his data visualization work. So this is all like, especially the first three here, there. this is old stuff. That's why I kind of mentioned it because I think it's, it's always interesting if like old concepts, you know, still hold true. Um, so Edward Tufte has a lot of, of books about data visualization and it's from the 50s and 60s, I think the earliest work. And it's sort of like data visualization classics that I like a lot. Um, if you're really into layout and stuff, you could you could read this. Of course, I had to mention him since I'm Swiss as well. <laughs> um, it's just, I think it's like the standard book about the grid system for like posters, not just scientific posters or like in general like layout. And um, for inspiration for like your eye catchers and stuff, I can recommend um, David Goodsell's The Machinery of Life. If you don't already know it, it's just a wonderful book to have. Um, He's the guy who does those watercolor paintings of like, you know, macromolecular structures or this is an HIV that, that he drew. He spent some months in like collecting the data and then he basically does these amazing watercolor paintings. Um, I just had to mention that as well, even though it's not just poster specific. Um, yeah, so these are some of the publications that I mentioned. Um, first and foremost, the point of view articles by uh, Wong and others that appeared somewhere in this time range, I think, in Nature Methods. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about those two from Laws Computational Biology. Um, there's another one that's more general about scientific conferences, which is kind of cool, which is also um, a good read if you're actually organizing a conference. So it's not just about posters, but conferences in general. Um, there's a small review that I did with Graham Johnson like a while back about this one is mostly about biomolecular structural data, so it might not be very relevant in this regard, but I think we do have some general recommendations about you know, gauging your audience and stuff that's, that's generalizable to other fields as well. And then Chris already mentioned some of those, but I can kind of like repeat those, especially those that are important for like graphics design and, and visualization. Um, the next who will be by Lauren, and she's gonna talk more about presenting stuff, the very best practices for presenters, and then 30 minutes on how to give a great 10 minute talk. And then we have more graphical stuff by Kat and Carlos in March. Um, there's a lot about Illustrator, those two dates, and also just like general about presentation graphics. Um, that brings me to the end. I would just like to thank Chris for giving me the opportunity to talk here and then the other instructors here at Lane, Kat, uh, Lingbo, Lauren, and Natalie, uh, Graham Johnson just for general like artistic inspiration, um, my former lab mates here at Stanford, Naomi, Robin, AJ, and Brendan, and my former PA, Ron Drawer, and then of course the sponsoring by, by Lane Library. So. Thanks a lot for, for joining me today. We still have like ample time for questions. Um, oh yes, there is this questionnaire survey thing that everybody should fill out. The feedback would be very valuable for me. Yes, that's a good point. So I was thinking like we already like, I kind of felt when I was preparing for this that there might be a need for actually like looking how to construct or how to like craft a poster in, it would be Illustrator in my choice. So I'm wondering whether there might be an interest, you know, 
um, an interest in that, like from you guys. Um, it will be a little bit different than what Kat is going to do for um, figures in general. It will be more poster specific. I will be talking a little bit how I organize my layers. There will be some useful shortcuts in Illustrator. Um, also a little bit about interplay with Photoshop, like how to like you know keep keep a good and efficient workflow, how to not lose resolution, or how to like keep resolution as high as possible. And um, that's also sort of where I you know had intended to talk more about like. CMYK versus RGB and resolution, all, all these things. Some of them already came up today, which is great. But um, I think one of the, or yeah, one of the questions on the questionnaire is about. If you're interested in that, let me know, and we can maybe Chris and I can maybe organize something in that regard. Thank you so much. Yes, sure. Better. Yeah, that should be fine. I mean, you're only asking for like a quick sort of yeah, feedback quick, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. I can just, you know, spend a few minutes or spend yeah, yeah, 10, 15 great. minutes and criticize. So That's fine. Yeah, you have my email, right? Yeah, but I can't. Sure, thanks. sure. Feel free. Hi. Oh, sure. I can do that. Uh, well, that looks I beautiful. Like this poster for a conference. Uh -huh. I went to last that November, great. but for I'm going to another conference and I'm going to do the sidebar. Okay. I hope you.